I've been asked to give a presentation in the next hour, which is quite a long time for a PowerPoint presentation, about um, sheep and beef sector, forestry and farming. And uh, to do this, um, we'll just skip the company one, and we'll go straight into our sector as one of great dynamic change, and there's nothing more dynamic than now. But just to set a frame for where we are going to end up talking a lot about forestry, is talking about our human population, our land use, our <coughs> livestock base, what's happened, um, our livestock productivity and prices, and then part two, it's going to be very greenhouse gas, forestry centric in the presentation. Um, I think we need to do part one just to set the frame where we are, and a whole lot of what I'm talking about will actually come through to thinking and comments uh, further on. So just uh, <coughs> kicking straight off, um, the first one is our human population. Now I use 1991 as a base for a lot of things because that was when New Zealand was essentially a market economy. There were no subsidy effects from the 80s or 70s left and the sector has been driven by how it's performed um, in world markets since then. But since uh, 1990 we've had a 44% population growth in New Zealand, which is quite significant. It's up there with the third world and it's way ahead of some of the Western countries we deal with in exporting our meat, like Europe and things, they've had 12 to 18 per cent. America might have had 20 uh, per cent if they can count their population. Um, but, you know, it, it is a phenomenal growth rate that we have had and it's all popped out in housing crises and all sorts of things and it's shown up elsewhere in countries like Australia too. But also in this, I, I'm interested in cars and in 1917, uh, uh, in 2017-2018 um, we registered just over 200,000 new motor vehicles in New Zealand which were Japanese import second hand and brand new vehicles, motor vehicles. So we deregistered 50,000 wrote them off. So there's 150,000 new cars most of those will be north of Taupo, where two-thirds of the population is. But it gives you an idea of the impact about where we are, what's going on, and some of the things we see more cars on the roads and all this. So we're coming back into carbon use. If we look at our pastoral land use since 1990, a lot of people aren't aware that the change in land use that we've had, and under the dynamics of being a market economy, our sheep and beef farmland, which is the green line up there, is 34% less than what we had in 1990. That's 4.2 million hectares have gone out. Nearly a million hectares of that went, of the best sheep and beef land went to forestry, I mean to, to dairy, and forestry's just had a, um, about a 0.4 million increase since then. But those are very significant changes in our economy and we have moved from our best sheep and beef land has gone to dairy and on top of that we've got this environment here where we're farming much less land. A lot of the uh, 3.2 million hectares take after taking off the dairy is largely gone, a lot of it's gone into Dock Estate uh, which is closing up high country places. Then we've had down country, we've had viticulture and all sorts of um, land use changes, um, e even orchardings increased um, and horticulture. Horticultural area coincidentally has expanded 44% in line with our population. So um, there's not a big natural export market as a productivity commission saying we should all get into horticulture, that'll be the answer. If it was there we would have been doing it, boats and all. But these are the dynamics that are behind us. Um, I don't think I can, yeah. Oh. So it's just keep that in mind, that land use change, so what we're dealing with. So with that land use change we've seen the dairy herd increase 86%. It's been up to a peak and it's coming down off it now. Um, our beef herd is down 19% and our sheep flock's down 53%. And that's up to our latest uh, stock number survey that we just completed for 30th of June 2019. So again, big, big dynamic changes in there. 
And if we look at our sheep and beef commercial farm population, in 1990, we had about 19,600 commercial sheep and beef farms. Here in 2018-19, the Stats New Zealand, the last agricultural census, uh, working the stats on that, uh, we've had we've down to 9,200, which is quite a drop in that period. And what's also happened with all this land use here, we have gone from about 68% extensive farm and about a third intensive sort of farming land. Uh, now we are, we're sitting on about 75% extensive and 25% would be left for the intensive guys on the easier country where the dairy isn't now. So these are huge sort of changes. The bars show the, our farm class types we have there which are really based on management systems. The high country, a wee bit of change from Lost to the Dock Estate, big change in the uh, North Island Hill Country which is really amalgamations of farms to make them economic. And then class five, um, you'll see that big drop there which is conversion to dairy. And look in Southland down there, that huge drop there which is dairy. And class six, those big drops in numbers of farms. So a lot of small farms uh, switched over to dairy or amalgamated to go into dairy. And that was all driven by the economics of the time and of the day. So if we look at livestock productivity, and at the top there, New Zealand's Silicon Valley, our powerhouse in our economy, where productivity's actually occurred in our economy. We haven't done it much. There's been little productivity real increase elsewhere. But our agricultural sector, our lambing percentage has gone up from 100% in 1990 to 128, say 29 more lambs per 100 ewes. They are phenomenal biological increases. And it hasn't happened by chance, it's happened by management, it's happened by our extension, it's been adoption and change in practices, and we've given up our best land to dairy, a million hectares of it, and we've still done this stuff. So nobody wants to talk about how good we are, but we are. Our lamb weights due to market demand have gone up about nearly a third from 14.35 kilograms, and that's the market demand. The market wants heavier carcasses, we don't even export lamb carcasses now, we export lamb cuts. So a lamb leaves the farm, its carcass may go to six different countries and different cuts for different markets, for different needs, for different niches. And I even say that our meat industry is actually a very sophisticated logistics industry, actually manages all that and does it. It's actually very slick. And that's a, you know, a huge sort of expertise that New Zealand has and we lead the codex and the international uh, food standards for shipping meat and stuff like that because we recognise that we're good at it. Um, then we come down to mutton, the ewes got heavier, which heavier ewes is correlated with higher lambing percentages. Wool production, we've lost interest in it and the prices are not that good. Steer weights have gone up a wee bit. And dairy production per cow, we've gone from about 260 kgs to about 380, which is with artificial um, insemination in the dairy herd, the theoretical increase is compound 1.1% per year in production. And commercially, we're doing about 0.8 to 0.9, which is really incredible. And then the last kick at the end is probably a bit of palm kernels help them get there. But um, it, that is the huge productivity increases. So when I talk, we're, our Silicon Valley of excellence is our agricultural sector. We can't stop saying it. We've got to say it. We've got to take the story to people about it. If we look at our production from 1990, we've got 215% more dairy production from about 86% more dairy cows. And that's that per cow production coming up. Our beef and veal is up 29%. A lot of that's cold cows for the expanded dairy herd. And we've got less lamb production from 53% fewer sheep, but only 9% less. Incredible. We still supply our high-paying wealthy markets with the high-paying cuts, high-price cuts. Phenomenal. So what does this productivity mean in terms of greenhouse gases? To produce today's export lamb production at 99 um, uh, animal performance levels, we would need 9 million more ewes to produce 9 million, for the 100% lambing back in 1990, to produce 9 million more lambs. 
we'd need another five and a half million lambs at the because they're twenty eight percent um, lighter back then, and we'd need three and a half million more replacement lambs because when you've got a lower lambing percentage, you've got to keep a bigger proportion of your replacement stock in there. So the yields we've got here, we used 1990, we'd, we'd yield about 64% of our lamb crop for export. Uh, today we're yielding around 80, 82%. So these are big impacts on our greenhouse gas footprint, this technology improvement. Um, so our emissions, if we're just looking there, um, just showing sheep, sheep's down about 41%, no surprise. We've got heavier sheep, but 53% fewer sheep. Uh, where beef cattle is about 9% less. Dairy's up 125%, but 215% more production for export. Um, so their intensity, the greenhouse gas footprint per unit of output, low for sheep and beef, much lower than it was back in 1990. And over the whole country, our ruminant footprint is up 10% from what it was in 1990, largely due to the dairy herd expansion. So sheep and beef combined are about, we're about 30% less than 1990 in our footprint. Export dominance, there's nothing driving us at all in the local market. And if we power our, our sheep and beef sector way down, we can feed New Zealand quite happily because we only uh, consume about 6% of our lamb production and uh, hardly any mutton production. In fact, we get such good prices for our mutton, we import a bit of mutton for our sausage industry from Australia, because it's cheaper. Uh, beef and, and veal, we export nearly 90% now. Dairy production, 94%. So everything our ruminant sector does is driven by how we perform in overseas markets. Um, if you look at meat exports, uh, just the impact of China coming along, and this is important, this is going to come along to the next bit. Um, is looking at about, we're up to about this year's first nine months year, about 38% of our meat has been going in terms of export receipts uh, come out of China and it's sort of been a, a slowly increasing trend and that comes back with our free trade agreement. If we look at logs, they've also part of the free trade agreement there, but 63% uh, in 2017 is the latest figures I could get uh, were exported to China. 2018 data's not available yet. Uh, it's a heavy dependence on logs into China and its construction industry. The rest of the markets would be India and probably Korea would take a big chunk of that. Farm gate price trends are all going up. These are driven by world prices and our exchange rate and the bottom brown line is the log price trend. And we've heard of log prices have just gone down recently and the big concern, this is the Olsen log price index which is a, a um, a private company, but its index it publishes a newsletter is 60% export, 40% local, so it's a composite thing, and that shows that, that drop in, in log price that's just happened quite sharply, quite suddenly. And just to look at our profitability, and from our workshop yesterday, that farm profit for 1819 will be up here, but more, not down, that was made back in uh, February, that forecast. Uh, but Profitability of sheep and beef farms are becoming bigger, and that's part of it. Keeping your eye on the sign. So, issues to the future current situation we're underwritten by demand from China and the world, and it's partly the uh, African swine fever has decimated their pig herds in China and most of Asia. Excuse and me, that's Rob. had a whole impact on the world demand for meat. Um, so, sorry, Rob, just, yeah. just a question on if you get just go back to the log price slide. So we've, we see the trend there, we've had a huge drop, we've had a huge drop, what is it, in May 2014. Is that a repeatable cycle, do you think, from what, what we've seen here? Or is oh, it, no. or is it just a one-off? It's hard to say uh, that one, because it's just the dependence of the log trade on China, and it's really China can go hot and cold. It might be hard to get a cycle in that. So, so is that like wool, wool in China in the 50s? So um, it, was, it was amping, amping, and then suddenly dropped? I can't comment too much on, on that. I'm not an expert on log prices or have been following them much. Okay. Um, 
Have you got any comments to your knowledge at all? Uh, no, I don't. I'm just just looking at it. Then you see the sharp drop in, in the past. I don't know that timber, timber pr price has dropped. I'm not an expert by any stretch yeah, either. Well, but you're looking at it and thinking. And I know is it um, Bryce Hurd um, was saying that there's there's these cycles and there's going to be a gap in a certain market at a certain time. Yeah. Um, because the log price is renowned for just, you know, the guts drops yeah, right Yeah, well, US we used to talk about 11, 13 year beef cycle, but they seem to be broken, they're not working the way they used to. That's going from 2000, May 2010 to now, that, that time series. So uh, we have seen that sort of strong growth in log prices that was coming and then boom. Um, but the other cycles there, I can't comment. This might be the GFC, when is it? GFC was before that. But I can't comment on what that chat was. <coughs> so just back quickly, um, underwritten by um, African swine fever and our supply chain integrity into key markets is important for where we are with our meat industry. Close on the horizon we've got Mvobis and that added about 2% of the cattle kill this year, slaughtered uh, under compulsory slaughter. Um, national policy statement on fresh water, nitrogen loads coming along, zero carbon bill, Brexit and fake meat, they all the sort of stuff on the horizon now. So we're up to part two and I'm going to run you a wee bit behind time. Um, zero carbon <coughs> bill is aimed to achieve no additional warming from New Zealand, it acknowledges CO2 and CH4 gases, methane uh, are different which is quite as far as we're concerned, it's very good. Um, and the split gases are going to be talked about relative to 2017 to cut um, methane emissions by 10% by 2030, 24 to 47% by 2050. Um, so a whole lot of work's been driven out of this. Um, and we, Beef and Lamb's position is any reduction greater than 22% implies that we will be cooling the planet with taking methane out. And I'll give you a bit more insight into that. So government policy is net zero for 2050 of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide in our farming sector might be quite a hard thing to do, but it's, it's in there and then that growth, those growth methane reductions. So proposed uh, greenhouse gas charge of this from the, uh, what's it, the ICCC coming up. Uh, is one cent on milk solids. Um, not clear when this might apply from, but it's likely to come in in the next couple of years. Uh, one cent on beef carcass weight, three cents on sheep meat, four cents on venison. So it's about 1,500 bucks for a sheep and beef farm, first off, and it would be about $1,600 for a dairy farm. So they have, I think the average is 160,000 kilograms of milk solids. So just gives you an idea of some of the things and that's to be spent on research uh, to help farmers. If we're looking at greenhouse gases, we need to really um, consider these things. And I talk about green carbon, which is biogenic, and that's biological cycles, um, system cycle greenhouse gas. So I'm part of the carbon cycle, I'm organic, um, and I'm breathing out carbon dioxide talking to you. And how much of this am I adding to they were warming. The answer is none because the food we eat, the um, animal products we export, the trees we harvest for domestic and export, are all part of the carbon cycle and it's all dependent on photosynthesis. We're taking carbon in. So the plants I've eaten and the animals I've eaten who have eaten plants, that carbon is part of a carbon cycle. And so we're not contributing. When we come to fossil carbon, I used to call it black carbon, but I'm told it's got a different meaning, but fossil carbon comes from fossil fuels. It adds new carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, which lasts for a thousand years. So you can, millennia is what they say, because the documentation that I read has different times. But it's long, very long living. And um, so the global increase from 380 five parts per million in 2010 to 410 parts per million in 2019 uh, is an increase of 6.5% and that came from fossil fuels. Really wasn't coming from biological processes. 
carbon uh, methane is a, uh, is a flow of gas from our livestock industry, it's not a stock of gas like CO2. CO2 is counted as a stock of gas that's gone from 385 parts per million to 410 parts per million. We're talking about the stock. But the methane molecule lasts 12 years and breaks down to green biogenic carbon dioxide. So I'm just trying to give you how thinking has we how we have to talk about this. This is all really good science. And our level of um, methane from New Zealand has been pretty static. The cloud of methane above New Zealand since about 1960. It was this pointer. If you look at that, that's going from about 1800 with no stop. And just modelling this methane that comes out of animals, it flows up into the atmosphere, and after about 12 years it's gone. So it's not permanent. So this warming blanket of methane we have sitting up there has been pretty flat. But we're talking about at the moment, working on this flow, that we're going to cut our flow down by um, 10 percent at least by 2030. So some of the thinking will come along, and this is backed by science and by one of the authors of uh, the IPCC report, Miles Allen, and some of this work I find is, is, is quite interesting. So the red line is sort of showing the net contribution along the bottom there, just on that dynamic flow of what's going on. But you know, methane is important in global warming because they've got a 25 factor warming potential above that of carbon dioxide. So carbon farming, a billion trees. So we've got subsidies out there now um, for indigenous mixed deforestation planting, $4,000 a hectare. We've got Manuka, Kanuka erosion subsidies out there and right down to exotics, uh, the Crown takes the first year of carbon if you take that uh, $1,500 per hectare uh, subsidy to plant trees. And then we have the ETS units, the, the New Zealand units for carbon, which is underwritten by government at the moment at $25 a tonne. And that's set, and so that's also what people are taking into account when they're looking at what to do. So trees as a carbon sink are only a stop gap uh, to fossil fuels and this is transformed to a lower order or nil emissions. So carbon sink is not saving a hell of a lot. People who are buying emissions trading credits and planting trees as an offset so they can keep doing what they did and yet we've got that stock of carbon up there. The real issue is how, how they reduce their um, activity uh, or their use of fossil fuels. Um, in the research, I was just reading the New Scientist magazine in, in the Europe, uh, is that people who are buying offsets to find the airplanes tend to have very big carbon footprints, but they feel good. But that they haven't changed their behaviours. That's what the uh, research is showing. So just keep that in mind. It's only a stop gap, it's not going to do a hell of a lot. Just buys a bit of time, perhaps, for those guys. So carbon farming so far, we've had a lot of angst for farmers, we know all about that. Um, and we've also noticed land prices already bid up from reforestation subsidies. Talking with Baker Ag, we, land prices of the east coast of the North Island have gone up about two grand a hectare. And that is factoring in the $25 a tonne emissions underwritten by that and the billion tree subsidies. So they've been factored straight into the land prices. So that might put a break on what people do to take it in, and we'll talk about that later. But just think, if the emissions trading price goes up to $50 a tonne, what do you think will happen to land prices? So everybody's talking about gains on this emissions trading and planting trees. Nobody's talking about the liabilities and what it means for the next generation. So are you going to commit a whole farm? Whole farm's committed. It's going to be a community loss, money leaving the district forest owners, Probably an offshore, live elsewhere. So we have, it's got great potential to create a um, absentee owners of land use. And then um, for exotics, if we're planting a lot, of, lot more trees because of emissions trading, we're not planting them for a market reason, we're planting them for ETS 
So in 30 years, if we go to harvest them, what's going to happen to my log price? I wouldn't bet on it being high. So this is the, these are the consequences of emissions trading on top of what it's going to do to log. So let's just quickly go in here. This here is a looking at a uh, North Island Hill Country farm. Just use this as an example. Uh, gross revenue per, per hectare is $1130, just nearly $1200 a hectare. The red stuff here is expenditure on the farm. The green stuff is a surplus which would go into um, things like farm drawings, debt repayment and uh, uh, and there's a few other things, technical things in there called rent and stuff, but the, the blue up there is interest, which is money out of the district and tax goes out of the district. So that shows roughly up to the top of the green line is all that money would go back into the district from the sheep and beef farming activity. And this here is going from year one. So the next 30 years, if you're farming, you're going to have an income stream coming along. So we're just mapping this, just saying it's going to stay where it was in a base year, and we're always going to get regular income from sheep and beef farming. If we go into harvest forestry, uh, we're going to get a bit more than gross revenue in terms of the economic activity for a hectare. That's 1,500 bucks, just a bit under that, for planting trees. Then we come along, nothing happens. Then we thin to waste, it's a production forest, this one. Then, then we have our first pruning, second prune, bit of a gap, third prune. And then, oh dear, nothing's going on in the district here. And then suddenly we're going to get about $88,000 a hectare at $140 a tonne for a log. Um, and then this is going to be the harvest. But, so that's ac activity in the district. The uh, green stuff uh, goes out of the district if it's absentee owners or whoever. Uh, if the person lives in the district, great, it'll come back and be spent in the district. So that's forestry allocation, per he just giving the, the lumpiness of forestry. Emissions trading, that's the growth of trees. This is off the MPI uh, carbon tables. I've used East Coast here. There's a pointer. Okay, these little red bits along here are uh, <coughs> just the annual increments of carbon. The green is those increments accumulated up for five years because the ETS the emissions trading guys only want to deal in five year glomps. They don't want to deal in annual things for administration. So the peak growth is about year 20 in your um, carbon accumulation, so, and then that's, those will give you an income stream later on. Um, so if we look in North Island Hill Country Farm, uh, and he's gone into a hectare of trees, and we're using emissions trading, and they've got an average system now, so that if you join the average system, uh, you're, you have average um, uh, NZ units that you, that you calculate, and then uh, you can harvest the forest and then replant it. As long as you did, so you don't have to go and buy new credits or sell all the, you know, so it makes it a bit, a bit more e economic, a bit more easier. Um, and we'll just explore what that means. So, in terms of economic activity in a district, suddenly you're getting two and a half thousand bucks here. This is pruning expenditure, and uh, that money there will probably come back and just cover that off emissions trading. This is the emissions trading receipts that you get in addition to all the expenses going on. So it starts to change how it looks quite a bit. But the whole farm conversion, if we're doing those, these, these things here are not going to be spent in the district. These bits here, planting the forest, maintaining it will. And then if we look at um, North Island carbon farming, where you're just planting trees, are so going to take carbon credits and walk away. Don't, not going to do anything else. And that's looking for 30 years. You might get growth out to 50 years on the tables, but I've kept all this to 30 years. So the annual revenue streams and sheep and beef farming are spent in the district. So this is district wellbeing we're talking about now. Intermittent re revenue streams uh, make it a bit, a bit harder. And a lot of money, if it's absentee owners, uh, a lot of dosh won't be spent back in the district. So that's going to change the whole nature. And this is where farmers are really onto it and really angst about what it means. So 
How do we evaluate all those expenditure streams? What does it mean? We put it onto a net present value, which is in today's money, and we built a model for this, and we've, it's been QA'd with Baker Ag, and it's been used to test it out in a few places, so it's pretty robust. And <coughs> I'm, I'm quite proud of what we've done with that. So we've got a sheep and beef farm survey feeding in there, we've got a log harvest model, we've got a planting to harvest expenditure model, and we've got a, an MPI carbon stock tables. So the model takes all that, looks it all up, and uh, gives some pretty interesting results. I'm here going to use class 4 North Island Hill Country again because that's where a lot of the discussion is. Applies everywhere else. Um, net present value analysis over a 30 year period. If I just look up here, you've got $506 per hectare. That's the 1718 EBITDA, which is earnings before interest, rent and management. So there's no calculation. We put forestry on the same thing so they can't fit all the numbers. This is, keeps it all on the same basis. And, um, and that's one of our leading KPIs too, by the way, in the model we've just talked about. The discount rate we're using in this is 6%, and we've used 6% because that's what Treasury is using at the moment for all of its discounting. And that, that seems pretty sensible. And so at that basis, if we discount that flow of income of $506 over 30 years, it's $7,400 per hectare. If we go into harvest forestry, and we've assumed in here, all these models we look at, the, the billion tree subsidy of $1,550 a hectare for planting has been put in, so it's a, this is looking at it as a farmer. Um, at $140 a, a tonne per log harvested, um, we have an EBITDA of $2,220. $260, which is 5000 bucks less than sheep and beef farming. And that surprisingly explains why we don't have blanket forestry over the whole country now. And it's, uh, it's, so what happens now if we chuck in forestry harvest plus $25 a tonne NZU, and we're going to harvest these, uh, these logs these trees at the end of 30 years. Uh, our EBITDA jumps up from 7,400 to, that's 9,050. So it's 1,650 in the black ahead of it. So it pushes farming into a really questionable state. If you go on our model, we can whack any, any parameter we like. If you whack the log price up to 200 bucks or down to 100 bucks and put the ETS units up to $50 or 75, we can see the result instantly in your face. So what happens after the first harvest? Because the ETS only applies for the first harvest. We then drop back to the second harvest cycle and your kids are not going to like you if you've locked the land up. So, not very good. But a great warm feeling for the, for the next 30 years that the next generation will not thank you. So if we go ETS and forestry only, it's still 6% discount rate and we have here a $25 um, NZ unit still. Um, without the logs coming in, we're, we're down to pretty near what, what sheep and beef are doing. So it's getting pretty close on a net present value basis. So that's why you hear these people talking about, I've done some sums and they're talking about, well, we'll just plant trees, we won't, have, we won't prune them or do anything, we'll just walk away from them at the end of 30 years or 50 years. So at year 50, you have zero revenue from uh, ETS only forest and you've left a huge liability. Somebody has to pay the rates, maintain the fences and things like that. And nobody ever talks about the disease it may get, it may burn down, it may blow down and you've got a liability to remedy that. Particularly if you've got a financial instrument over it, you've got to restore that. So it's not going to come free. But we, nobody talks about it. 
And if you're planting indigenous forest only, you'd have an income stream of about 980, which could be very beneficial to an existing farm. I'm just about out of time. Um, the mosaic, I'd like to think of existing farms having a mosaic of <coughs> livestock and carbon farming. I think the poor areas of farm need to be planted in trees for the long term. Um, the contour and location of the trees probably won't be ideal for foresters near roads, easy access to harvest, but could be just maybe carbon farmed and probably the species to do that. Um, and it could be, you know, this is for conservation and carbon farming, could be a really good fit. And that may have some real benefits. Um, and livestock farmed on the best country, and, uh, it may, and that would, you know, you're planning for the future generations in this sort of, talking about uh, within a farm. But when you're going to talk about whole farms being planted, um, we could get, um, into very, very different sort of countryside. Rob? Yep. Just a quick point to, to point out that the different, one of the key differences between indigenous and, and plant or exotic planting is that the indigenous plant, um, planting revenue stream, while smaller, is for about 300 years. Yep. So it's, 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 it's a long-term play um, and actually gives you a, a side income stream for, you know, for a very long time. Yep. So... There's all, yeah, so it depends how this carbon market takes off, if it becomes a, a true natural market at the moment, it's a government underwritten market, uh, whether it gets a life of its own, is still pretty hard to see. So there's there quite a lot of risks there, yep. A good point, Jeremy, yep. Um, so livestock and farming and farming, um, whole farms, we've got a, a big potential there, which I think is a reaction we see now, is about absentee owners and what that does to the district and the flow and effects from that. Supply of farms, if we think about it, we have an age structure of baby boomers out there who may want to retire, and the best price to sell their whole farms may be to forestry. So that's one of, one of the, uh, the risks there, particularly if your children aren't interested in coming on, onto the farm. ETS and subsidies have been capitalised into a price of land. I've covered that. If we go to $50 a, a tonne, I'm pretty sure I know what's going to happen to the land price. And it won't be related to meat production and wool production. Um, the other thing is, who are these ETS buyers we keep talking about? Because the government tries to wave their arms around the air, and well, we've got five big companies in New Zealand that are you know, in the market. Um, but the point is, those guys, if the price goes up, two things can happen. One is the, these guys who are companies who are emitters may want to buy farms, plant trees, as a security to protect them from where the price may go. They're not interested in the emissions trading, they're inter interested in... So that's what one strategy for business. The other one um, could be is these businesses then have to... If, if they're buying these credit, carbon credits and pushing the price up, it's got to end up in their cost of business passed on to consumers. So I'm not sure how big an impact that will have. Um, and so you can, um, I don't know, where the $25 a tonne underwritten by government will go, it's, it's a big uncertainty, it's not a risk, it's an uncertainty. Uh, policy implications, we've got the zero carbon bill targets, but also we've got the national policy on freshwater uh, management coming out, and I think that's going to deliver some of those CH4 targets, methane targets. You know, administrators are seeing these separately when I talk to them, but I think I know our farmers see these as a whole. They see the whole, they're farming the whole farm. These guys are in silos of bits of the farm. And I think we have to look at integration of those as an organisation talking to these things. Because I think we may be delivering some of the carbon targets from other policies coming along. I mean, it's complex, very complex but we've got to do the best for our sector and make sure that, that we are there and it's, we're there for the right reasons. And please remember that slide I talked about methane and the methane cloud above New Zealand and it's a flow in and a flow out. And that's going to come into the dialogue coming up um, everywhere. And just to end up, we've got baked vegetables out there now in America.
place and meet. That's Arby's restaurant, Crane.